WrestleMania. Too big for one night. Oh my Christ almighty. They sure were trying to sell the hell out of that, weren't they? Weren't they? I gotta I got give them credit. They were trying to spin this. This is a truly unique and different WrestleMania. And I always try to tie it back into the it's happening on two nights. And yeah, that's not what makes this unique. Come on now. They were trying. They were trying. And admittedly, heading into night one of WrestleMania, there was a bit of a morbid curiosity there because I really didn't know what to expect. Right. A WrestleMania without a crowd. A WrestleMania without crowd noise. A WrestleMania without fans. A WrestleMania without fan reactions outside of the fan on the roof or on the ceiling of the performance center, apparently. Didn't know what to really make of it. Because it's just it had this overwhelming feeling of, let's just hurry up and get this over with. They insisted on doing the show anyways. They insisted on it. Let's just get through it and then forget that the show ever happened. And, and I gotta confess, I, after watching this show, you probably had one thing that was truly memorable or re most of them will eventually quit, go into the schmas of your wrestling memories and you'll hardly remember anything about it. It's just what it is. The show did not get off to a good start. And I gotta say this, like, if you're going to do a recorded WrestleMania, like you have the opportunity to film spots multiple times, to go through and make sure your editing is crisp, your is pristine, and, and that stuff wasn't happening throughout night one, especially early on. It felt like the day went along, but my goodness, some of it was really Bush League and amateurish. Uh, that opening women's tag match, you know, excuse me, I do want to say one thing. You've already got two nights. You already had 16 matches. Did we need to have a pre-show match with Cesaro and Gulak? Really? Especially since they were just going to appear later on in the show? I mean, for God's sake, Cesaro won with an airplane spin. An airplane spin! It's 1960s and 70s wrestling all over again! But, you know, you're watching the Kabuki Warriors and Bliss and Cross, and you can tell that they're trying... I was more riveted by the Kabuki Warriors screaming and yelling and talking in Japanese back and forth more than I was anything else of this match. And of course, Alexa Bliss goes over after hitting the horrible looking Twisted Bliss. Like, we can't even hit the midsection of somebody. We're going to hit their legs. And I'm supposed to buy that that's a finisher? And you didn't make her continue to redo it until it didn't look like absolute crap? That match was bad. Not as bad as Elias and Baron Corbin. This is one of these weird matches that you really don't want to see. You don't think it benefits either party. And ultimately, you're validated. It helps neither party. Funniest thing about all of this is Baron Corbin cutting a promo in an empty arena, acting like he's talking to people. You're like, you know what? Yeah, that about makes sense for him. That's about right. Uh, this match was lame. This match stunk. The finish was bad. And as bad as I thought the first finish was in the first match, this finish was even lamer. Elias doesn't get an impressive victory. He gets a cheap victory. He's rolling up Corbin and having to grab tights. So it's not going to help him. It's not going to help Baron Corbin. Which, in the grand scheme of things, probably wasn't going to help either one of them anyway. Because who's going to want to remember this show? I mean, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We should have known, though, that something was funky when Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler was going third on this card. That should have been the hint that something was not quite right. That should have been the hint that this wasn't going to go maybe how you thought it could, should, or anticipated it would. Uh, it started off all right. Like it felt like it was building up to be the first decent match of the night. And yeah, then, the finish. Perfect example of how a finish ruins a match. You gave Becky a freaking truck. You got her driving around in that. You've been having her do that for a few weeks. So she sits there. She's driving around. She's talking about how she's the man. And yet for the second straight year at WrestleMania, 
She went with a garbage-ass finish. And for those that are trying to positively sunny side up spin this like they pathetically always do, well, this means the feud continues. Why? What's the point? She's rolled through pretty much everybody. You had built up Shayna to a point where it felt like it was right, the time was right to have her win the belt, so of course she didn't. No matter how much you try to force the man down everybody's throats, she is not that level of star, period. Period. And what was shaping up to be a good match had an absolutely queef fast finish. And this whole match just ended up being a wet fart that you wanted to forget about really quickly. Now, I was being a smartass, imagine that, on Twitter before this match happened. But I was saying that, you know, Taxi Sammy could potentially be dominant here as a performer. Because God knows, he's used to empty arena matches and matches with no reactions from the audience. And by God, this Intercontinental Championship match between Sami Zayn and Daniel Bryan was good. Easily buried the first three matches, in my opinion. I was worried that it was actually going to end up being the match of the night. I enjoyed it. I actually legitimately enjoyed it. Still trying to figure out what was the whole point of having Daniel Bryan wrestle Drew Gulak just so that way he could be in his corner at WrestleMania. Like, that's the type of crap that doesn't make any sense to me. But in this type of setting where you have no fans, you've got to get something going and you got to do something different focus on storytelling elements focus on emotions focus on actions and reactions and that's what this match did i am not surprised that taxi sammy in an empty arena was dominant easily his best work at wwe in my not so humble opinion easily the best pure match of night one has to be the triple threat uh, ladder tag team title match, even though there were only three guys in it, not six. Uh, hats off to all three of them. Morrison, Kofi, Clinton. Yeah, I don't know what the hell was with that trolley gummy worms look that he's got going on. But hey, whatever, dude, it's their own. And one of the Usos, whichever one it was. Drunk or sober, I can't remember. No matter what. This match was really, really damn good. I even liked the finish on this one. I really liked the finish. Try to do something a little different, a little creative. It works for me. I have massive credit to these three guys for going out there and busting their ass when they didn't have to. It wouldn't have made much of a difference if they did or they didn't, but they did. And I commend them for it. John Morrison wins. And, oh! Oh! Oh, this is so exciting. Like, I can't wait! To engage Tony in conversation about this. I ought to get him something. Like a Robo Jomo. Is that what you think? Yeah. Something like a Robo Jomo. So at 3 o'clock in the morning it always goes. Listen. This is make believe. Oh, God. It was fantastic. Fantastic. Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. The first part of the match was just one of these things where I'm just waiting for this exercise of futility to get over. I wasn't into it, wasn't feeling it. Then, of course, you have Kevin Owens win via DQ. He only then end up restarting the match and making it the type of match it probably should have been to begin with, which was a no-DQ match. Kevin Owens has his big fat boy spot off of the WrestleMania sign, and that worked. Um, I just was not that into it. The, second, the last few minutes of the match were actually really good, uh, but... The Monday Night Messiah shtick and everything else. Nah, I'm, I'm good with all that stuff. Uh, Kevin Owens wins. Yippee skip. whoop de woo Moving on next. Speaking of next, who's next? Braun Strowman. Goldberg. World title match. That's what you get at an empty arena WrestleMania. God, that was bad. That was so, so bad. If anything else... The one thing about it, while I wish they would have just let freaking Goldberg win and carry the strap until Roman comes back and actually have the match that we should have had, maybe at a SummerSlam or something, if there's any justice in the world, it's the fact that Braun Strowman won that whacked ass match for his first world championship about two plus years too damn late and in front of absolutely nobody. <sighs> justice is sweet, kind of. Be better than Braun. And 
this weekend, probably not going to be hard to be better than Braun. Because this match was brutally bad. Thank God this company did not make it the main event. Because what they made the main event was the Boneyard match. Undertaker, AJ Styles. And I make no apologies for it. I hate American Badass Taker. I hate Big Evil Taker. I hate Human Taker, period. It's not my jam. Never has been my jam. Never will be my jam. So I hear the Metallica music, and here he comes riding his motorcycle down the street or the highway or whatever. I'm like, oh, pfft. this match I already didn't want to see. Now you've really got me not wanting to see it. And then it started. And it was fantastic for me. Like, this was worth waiting for the whole night for. I am so glad that this company main evented it on night one. Because nothing else could have followed it in terms of the viewing audience at home. Sure, it was hokey. Sure, it was corny. Sure, it was overproduced. It was incredibly cheesy on the drama. It was incredibly cheesy on the dialogue. It was incredibly cheesy with the action and the camera shots and the cutaways and everything else. The druids run in and da 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 And that's exactly why it worked for me. It was outstanding. It was the type of match that you sit there and look at it and you say, Jesus Christ, why couldn't they have figured out to do this with Taker a few years ago? It's a big match and stuff like this. It would have added life to his career. Really? You know, how seriously do you really take AJ in this type of spot? I don't know, but some of the Healy stuff of, I'm sorry, please don't bury me, <laughs> was fantastic. I thought it was great. And compared to what else was on this show, it just blew the roof off the joint for me. It was ironic because this match, as part of a regular WrestleMania, maybe doesn't work so well. Maybe doesn't leave people satisfied. Maybe disappoints a lot of people, especially thinking about it. If... WrestleMania would have actually done WrestleMania this year. You had it in Raven James Stadium. I know how pissed you would have been as a fan if one of the reasons you bought a ticket was to see Undertaker versus AJ Styles, and then you have to direct your ass up to the big screen to watch Undertaker versus AJ Styles. You probably wouldn't have liked that too much. Well, in this type of setting, in the reality that we're currently dealing with, it was perfect. You can't do these all the time. But if you do them, you do them well, man, they can really connect. And this match really connected for me. I absolutely enjoyed it. It left me feeling a lot better about night one of WrestleMania than I really should have felt. Because even with that Boneyard match, it does not change the fact that this did not feel like WrestleMania. And no matter how much I appreciate the attempt at a distraction, the good portion, majority of the night, I'm just sitting there and saying, we couldn't have delayed this. We couldn't have had a real WrestleMania. Like the ladder match, these guys are bumping around. And instead of getting the pops that really feed the energy and the environment and the aura of the match, you get nothing. Having maybe the fans crap all over Braun Strowman for winning his first world title, we got nothing. You know, Owens does this great spot off the WrestleMania sign on the Rollins on the table. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. No matter how much you try, you just can't help but feel like this was just a Raw episode or a SmackDown episode recorded at the Performance Center. One of the big misses of the night to me was you might as well hooked up the frickin' tag titles to the ceiling fan. Like, nothing screams big leagues like WrestleMania and a ceiling fan. Oh, my God. Some of the matches and some of the finishes were squirrely and poorly done. Which is frustrating, especially knowing that this shit wasn't done live! It could have been better, it should have been better. But at least for night one, I enjoyed the fact that we weren't trying to pound six hours of show into one night. It's nice to get some of it, and then come back Sunday night and get the second half of it. That's a good feeling. That probably will continue in future years. Uh, the Boneyard match was great. The ladder match for the SmackDown Tag Titles is really good. You would look up and see Owen's spot. It's fine. Other than that, this show is mostly missable. 
and you'll forget it in a couple of weeks.